Welcome to an all-new episode of the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with the Deputy Mayor of the Municipality of Colchester, Nova Scotia, Jeff Stewart. But before we head into today's interview, we would like to remind you to hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you're hearing this episode so you can stay up to date on all the latest interviews and episodes of the Cross Border Interviews. Now, on to the show. Uh, Deputy Mayor Stewart, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to start with the question that I've asked almost all my guests, and you're no exception to the first question. So where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Jeff? Well, I've always had an interest in community. I've been involved in a number of organizations for many years. Through the, I spent uh, 25 plus years as a volunteer firefighter. And I served in a number of capacities there, as from the lowest ranking firefighter to fire chief. And I, I was also involved with minor hockey with the kids and the junior hockey program here in the community. And when I worked, I uh, worked spent my most of my working career was with Lafarge Canada, and we had a union environment at work, and you you had to belong to the union, so I got involved with that. I had to be had to be part of it, so I got involved with that. So I've always had some part of political twist to my life going through things. And in 2012, the summer of 2012, we had a number of things going on in the community. And there was one in particular that held a public meeting and a number of people didn't agree with what was going on. And I spoke up at the meeting and basically told the counselor of the day that I was going to put my name on a ballot and run against them in the fall election. So when I walked out of there, my wife looked at me and she said, uh, you realize what you said? I said, yes, I do. And I'm going to stick to what I said. So, I put my name on the ballot, and that was 2012. Here we are. So 11 years later, you seem to still enjoy it because you don't continuously put your name forward unless you don't enjoy what you're doing. But I want to get to who Jeff is before we talk about the role of municipal council. And did you ever think that you'd ever be a politician? Was that ever something growing up you'd want to be, or was municipal politics thrust upon you because as you said you just appeared at a public hearing one day and you said i'm gonna do it <laughs> actually I, I i was involved with with a with political life in some to some degree as growing up and i, I was never really involved I, I considered it but municipal politics wasn't wasn't something i thought about and then when the opportunity came this when this opportunity came I uh, decided, as I said, to put my name forward, and uh, I've I've been approached by a number of, of the parties since then to run provincially, and my heart and soul is is in the municipal world. I since getting involved, this is this is where I want to be. Why is that? So, in the crux of what this show is about, it's about sort of promoting what municipal issues are, but also why municipal issues matter. And I believe, and I, I kind of get from the sense of the question that you, the answer you just gave, there was an apathy for yourself when it growing up around municipal politics, provincial politics, federal politics. That's the fun, the sexy type of politics. But municipal, it was never for me something that we talked about on a regular basis. We did because we had people involved. But why do you believe municipal government is the the best served government and the easiest to sort of have a passion for for yourself? Well, well for me, if a, if a constituent has a concern, they can pick up the phone and, and they know who's going to answer the phone. It's not going to be an assistant. It's not going to be somebody on the other end of the line who's going to pass the message forward. It's, it's me that answers the phone. You know, we are a level of government that, and it's been stated many times, we are the closest to the people. You know, we mo uh, many of my phone calls are not even municipally related. You know, I get a number of calls in, on federal issues. I get them on provincial issues. But it's it's nice to, when people call, that you can 
you can either steer them to the right authority or help solve their problem. And, that, and that's where it's all at, is, is helping the people. You talk about sort of the unknown uh, issues that are brought to you, whether they be federal or provincial issues. Now, for someone who's been in politics for almost 11 years now, coming up on 11 years, have you seen that changed? When you first got elected, were they more municipal issues that you were dealing with compared to now where they're more federal or even provincial issues? Or have you sort of just seen the same issues throughout the uh, your tenure as a municipal councillor? I, I I think today there's there's probably as many issues than I, I guess when I first started I wasn't I wasn't as well known for sure in in the municipal world and you know most of the issues came were were more directed to what was going on in, within my own community but certainly with my role that I've taken on since getting into municipal government I get more but one thing that has always been consistent are highways road road issues that seems to be the biggest issue for for me and many of many of my colleagues actually that that we get more inquiries on than anything because a lot of people don't determine the difference between municipally owned roads provincially owned roads and private roads they see a sign that says you live on such and such a road or a street and they really don't know whose responsibility it is. But should that matter at the end of the day, though? Because if a resident comes to a municipal councillor or provincial MPP or an MLA or even an MP, they want their issues addressed. And you as the local representative, as you said, the easiest to access, the easiest to talk to, because you'll pick up the phone when they call you. Should it matter to the resident if it is a federal or a provincial or a private uh, road and as their elected official, their local elected official, should you not be able to champion and should municipalities just understand that the role of municipalities is to address all issues and not just what they believe are municipal issues? Well, I definitely will try to address the issue with when the person calls me. I, you know, I, I definitely try and tell them whose responsibility it is, who's, who's, you know whether it's to uh, be repaved or to be plowed or graded or or whatever. I try and set them so and, they, and maybe educate would be a good word to use. Educate them on the responsibility of it, so so they're not expecting something to happen from from a body that really has no jurisdiction. Understandable. I, I want to talk about the role of a counselor and of particular of the municipal government in general. You you are dealing with a lot of issues right now, and the role of municipal governments are kind of under a strain right now because there's a lot of things going on in the world, cost of living, affordability, financial crisis, housing issues. But the role of the municipal councillor is to sort of be educated and be aware of the issues that are going on in communities across uh, their, rep, their community. Sorry. Do you see your role as having a major weight of responsibility to understand what the issues are, but be educated in where the issues are coming from, whether they be housing and homelessness and social issues, or even the financial crisis and the cost of living increases. Do you see your role having a weight and responsibility that other levels of government may not have? I certainly try to keep, keep educated and, and up to date on, on what, what, are the issues for the for the people of the area for sure and and in our municipality for you know who so that you can you can respond when, when they have a question or a concern at least when you give them an answer it, it's or respond to them it's to the best of your knowledge that of of how to help them or how to move it forward or you know and sometimes you, you just can't you can't answer the question they may have but at least be able to forward them to somebody who can provide the right answer or the right direction for the resolve. Does communication come into play a lot in your job? 
does communication with not just the people in your sort of uh, echo chamber, the people who you believe or you talk to, your family, your friends, your people on social media, but all people, even the people who didn't vote for you, because we, we often find ourselves, particularly in 2023, inside a echo chamber. When I ask municipal councillors from across Canada, how do they get outside their bubble and talk to people who may not agree with them all the time? How much does communication come to play when you're talking about municipal issues for yourself, but also for municipal governments? I think communication is critical for anything. You know, you communication is, as I said, is critical. There's, you, you don't have... You, you can't respond. You can't work with people if, if you if you're not communicating with them. Understandable, understandable. But do you do you is communication comes with respect, does it not? Because you have to respect people that they're going to approach you correctly and approach you uh, respectfully as well. And you, as the deputy mayor and counselor and uh, representative of your community, have to be able to sit down and listen to all sides, even the sides that you may not agree with. Is that correct? Or do you try to oh, just. for sure. Okay. No, definitely. No, it, it, you're definitely right. It, you know, whether, whether the person coming to you with an issue or a topic is something that you agree with, you still have to be, you, you still represent them. And it, as you stated earlier, you know, whether they elected, whether they voted for me or not, I don't know. I never see the ballot, so I don't know who did or who didn't. So you have to assume that these people, you know, regardless of where they may stand on it, you have you have to you have to support them in the best way you can. How much what do you mean by support? You have to support people in ensuring that their voices are heard around the council table. But your role as the councillor, as deputy mayor of Colchester County, and any particular councillor or mayor who's listening to this, is to make the ultimate final decision. So how do you respect someone? And I think this is an important question. I, I've never asked this, so I apologize, <laughs> Jeff, for asking you this. But how do you respect people? And make the final decision that may upset people, because you're not going to you're not going to please 100 percent of the people on every decision you make. And I think you probably understand that more than most people. How do you do that? Because you're there to make sure you're doing the best for your community. But you may have people telling you, Jeff, this is not the decision I would have made because I think it's better this way. So how do you respect people and respect your constituents? while still understanding that you have a vote to make and sometimes you're not going <laughs> to please every single person. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> I've I've been down the road where I where I where I voted at the council chambers chambers that was not 100% and the, the what the people wanted. But when when I go into a council meeting or if I'm making a decision based on whatever whatever the topic is of the day, I try and make the decision based on what I feel at the time is the best for the municipality as a whole and what the majority of the people would expect for a decision to be made. And to, to quote, uh, to quote my favorite movie, Star Trek, uh, how do you, oh, <laughs> you're laughing, but it is kind of my favorite movie and it's my favorite quote. How do you uh, weigh the needs of the many against the needs of the few or the one? Because sometimes the needs of the many need to outweigh what people may believe themselves. And you talk about how you're feeling, but if I go talk to a hundred people in your community tomorrow and ask them what the biggest issue is, they'll tell me a hundred different things. And if I ask you right now, which we're going to ask in a few minutes, what you believe is the big issue, they're not going to line up. So how do you, choose which way you're going to go is it just like you said a gut feeling and try to figure out how you believe the the majority of people are going to side with you or at the end of the day do you just have to make the toughest choices well i i think it's a number of things i think sometimes you just have to make the tough choices i think other other things that come to mind and, and that's again the communication and trying to keep up on what's going on in the area, in the municipality, and across the province, across the country, are the concerns and the needs of the people. And, you know, what are the issues in Nova Scotia, or Colchester County in particular, 
many of the issues are the same here as they are across the province and across the country. They may be on a different scale, but many, many of the things align with each other. So I try and keep up with what's going on, obviously, provincially, nationally, and, and certainly locally, so that I have somewhat of a, a know of what, what people may be wanting or looking for. Now, you, you talk about national. For those who do not know, I did mention it in my introduction, but I'll mention it here again. Um, Deputy Mayor Stewart is also the uh, Vice President of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities as well. And I, I want to talk about that organization, if you don't mind, for two seconds. I just want to ask one simple question here. Um, municipalities across Canada are dealing with a lot of issues, the particular the housing crisis. The housing crisis is probably one that municipalities are dealing with a lot. How do you see FCM playing a role in the housing crisis and trying to address this housing crisis with provincial counterparts and their federal counterparts as well? Because everyone needs to come to the table for this. And you're on the front lines. You're in the meetings with uh, President uh, Scott Pierce, who's friend of the show. Uh, you're in the uh, meetings with uh, Tim Houston, your premier of Nova Scotia with Justin Trudeau. Give us some glimmer of hope that the the three levels of government are working together on this, Jeff, because all I'm hearing right now is it's a crisis that's going to be going for a long time and there's no end in sight. Well, I I, I don't know if there's an end in, end in sight for sure. It's definitely being worked on. It's a file that has the interest of all three levels of government and all three levels of government have to work together. There's not one level of government, federal, provincial or municipal, that's going to do it alone. Each and every one of us have to work together. It's, it's for the betterment of the country. And when the country's flourishing, then everybody will. So, you know, it's, it's something that we all have to be together on the same page to sit. And again, when we come back to the communication piece, we have to communicate with each other because we're all, in, like, as you mentioned earlier, we some, you know, the, the story you may hear a different opinion from one person and from somebody else. So if we sit together and we discuss all these things, I think that's that's the resolve moving forward, and it's, it's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of effort, but I think we we do have to work together. Collaboration is key in a lot of issues right now, particularly nationally. But I want to go closer to home with uh, Colchester County. How does collaboration come into play in in a community like Colchester County? Because I can imagine there are different fractions or factors in the community, whether it be urban and rural, whether it be, uh, 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 I'm blanking right now, but urban and rural, let's just take that divide here for a second. How do you collaborate with diverse groups of people to ensure that it's in the betterment of the community? Well, you know, we've got 11, 11 different councillors on our on representing districts within Colchester County. And of course, our mayor is, it makes up for the 12 people that sit on our council. And, you know, each each member talks to different people in their area, obviously. So they all bring their perspective to the table. And, you know, when we, we sit down to do our budget or we do whatever, then each each person brings their concerns forward. And then we have to prioritize what we want to do and where the concerns are, where the growth patterns are happening, and and try and move 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 the municipality forward for the for the betterment of, of everyone. There's a lot of concern right now that I'm hearing from your uh, council, not council colleagues, but councillors from across Canada about the role of uh, municipal councillors changing over the last five years, and you probably have seen this. You, more counselors are becoming more easily accessible. You talk about picking up the phone earlier on in the conversation when people call you, but you're not going off to Halifax to do your job. You're not going off to Ottawa to do your job. To quote Scott Pierce, you are the government of proximity. You make a decision. The decision you make takes effect the next day. You are in your community the next day. How do you and how have you been able to balance the personal life of a counselor with the private life of a counselor? Because if you go out to the grocery store, I can imagine there's probably people stopping you and asking you questions and asking you about the decisions you made or what's going on in counselor or some of the issues that they may raise. 
And there's days that you probably are okay with answering those questions. And there's days that you probably just want to go pick up some milk and go home and not take two hours. How do you balance the the the, the public life with a private life of a local government official for you? Well, for me, if it doesn't matter where I am or what I'm doing, if, if somebody approaches me with an issue that's going for a municipal or where, whatever you know, even if it's a provincial or federal issue, I, I'll take the time to talk to them. I don't, I don't stop and say no. I'm sorry today. I'm, I'm doing this or doing that. I take the time. Whenever, whenever they reach out to me, I try and make the time. Same, you know, with social media, with emails, with everything else. You know, I don't. Sometimes I respond back into an email rather quickly. Sometimes it takes a few hours, but I try and at least acknowledge. And I may, I may not be able to answer the question for them at the time. And if I can, then, you know, I'll say I may be a day or two before I get back to you. But I try I try and take the time whenever I'm approached to, to uh, at least acknowledge the person. Does that not weigh on family time, though? And I'm not trying to be rude there. It's just I can imagine uh, I, as someone who was married to I was married to a politician. So I knew that when we went out, that we would not be going out for 10 minutes. We would be going out for at least three hours just to go grocery shopping. And I can tell you some days I just wanted to be that 10 minutes. And that's as a family perspective. And, that, and I, I, I'm not sure yeah. if I should be asking you or asking your partner, but I'm going to ask you, does it weigh on family time as well? There's, there's no doubt that it, at times it, it can interfere with family time. There, there's no doubt about that. You know, and I, I'm very fortunate to have a, a wife that's very understanding and very supportive. I, I'm very lucky that way. You know, as I stated earlier, I've been involved in a number of things in the past, and each and every one of them took me away from family at, at the time. So, you know, we've been we've been married now for 40 years, and a little better than 40 years, and I'm very lucky to have the support of the system that I do. That's awesome to hear. Hopefully people who are listening take that away and tell their their significant <laughs> other that there is glimmer of hope that if a deputy mayor of <laughs> Colchester County can survive 11 years as a deputy mayor and counselor, that they can too. I, I want to turn to Colchester County as a whole now. But before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it. And I preface this question all the time with every single person who's ever been on the show, who's ever been an elected official. This is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the deputy mayor's opinion and only his opinion. We seem to get emails about this question. I do not know why, but we seem to get emails about it. So, Jeff, in your opinion and only your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing Colchester County today as of recording this episode, I the biggest biggest issue that we're going to have here. I there's a number of them, and, I, and I, it's hard to it's hard to point to just one particular one. Well, but, you can do one, you can do three. We've had people who've listed off yeah. ten, <laughs> however I, many you, you know, want to talk about. I think you know. Well, right now, Colchester County is going through. It's a provincially direct, a provincial directive that we have to do countywide planning, and that's for land use bylaws and land use, and that's a process that we're in the middle of right now. So that that is that is a huge issue for us. We're doing public consultation on that, so that that is one. Obviously, Colchester was in the spotlight a few years back with with the mass with the mass casualty that took place. So policing is a topic that is being very much looked at by by council at the time and you know housing is an issue across the country it's a housing housing is an issue everywhere and that's something that we have to deal with and our infrastructure you know we've got okay. aging infrastructure that's going to have to be upgraded thank you for that now I'm going to ask the first question, and it's the big one. And it's one that I get angry about whenever I talk to municipal councillors. Apathy. You talk about the countywide planning that the province has sort of downloaded or requested of municipalities across Nova Scotia to do. And you talk about the planning engagement, the public engagement that the county is going through to ensure that they do their due diligence. Now, I believe, and this is my opinion here, not the deputy mayor's, this is my opinion, 
there's an apathy when it comes to municipal governance, particularly in this country. Do you see that when you're doing these public engagements? Do you get the engagement that you're looking for, that the county is looking for, to make informed decisions? Because I, as someone who worked in municipal politics, who had to do some of these public engagements, I could tell you, we always saw the same five people. And you can never go on the same five people for all these engagements. So for you, do you see the engagement that you would hope for when you're going through this countywide planning land use to, uh, bylaws changes? I'm, I'm quite surprised at the uptake we've had from the public on this. We've had uh, eight or nine different sessions, and we've had pretty good numbers from each of the each of the engagements. Obviously, some of the more rural ones that had less people in, but we never saw the same people showing up at each one with the same complaints. It was it was very good, and you know we've had seventy to eighty people at some of them, and they were very engaged and spoke their of their concerns and what they would like to see in their communities, how they would like things to handle. So no, it was, it, it's been great. I mean, we're, we're going to be doing it again. We, this, we've done the first rounds, so to speak. So we can go back and put a, a draft together and then go back to the people so that they, then they can see it on paper. What, what we've, what we've heard, what, where we go, and then we can build on it from there, but we're, we're doing it over a two year process. So, we're hoping to have something in place by uh, the end of 2024. So there's going to be plenty more engagement yet. And we're bringing in some of the stakeholders, especially Colchester. You know, we have a large agricultural area. So we had a, a meeting with the agricultural industries to get their, their intake, you know, an uptake on what we, what they would like to see and how we can do things there as well. So. You, 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 you talk about the, uh, the infrastructure and it seems to be a common theme across Canada that our infrastructure is aging out and I know through FCM uh, they've been calling for a new fiscal uh, framework from the federal government and the provincial government but in the short term that's not going to happen I'm not trying to burst anyone's bubble here it's just not going to happen <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> how do how does well, Colchester County prepare for the future with trying to with the ongoing negotiations on the side here how do you ensure that the infrastructure doesn't dilapidate and cause more issues than you want than just waiting for sorry i want to rephrase this how does colchester county ensure that the infrastructure problems that they're facing today don't become worse over time because while we're waiting for the new fiscal framework to come into play with the federal and provincial governments, you're still left holding the bag. You're still left trying to figure out how you're going to update this uh, infrastructure imbalance that the county is facing. Well, we've been, we've been quite fortunate, you know, council, members of council before me were, were smart enough and had the foresight to, uh, begin putting funds away in capital reserve funds years ago, and we continue to do it today. We have a fantastic public works department who, who do a fair bit of, you know, camera work in the pipes to check things over and the preventive maintenance programs that are there to, to maintain what we have and try and, and try and keep it going for sure. And we do a certain amount of capital upgrades every year so that we're not going to be behind the eight ball. We're, or we're certainly hoping that that's the case that we don't get behind something that we're not able to fiscally be responsible for. So how, you know, how much it's, does it's asset management come to play here? Pardon me. How much does asset management come into play here? Because well, I think it's big. Okay. Yeah, I think it's big. I mean, and we, our staff have certainly taken that, taken that uh, themselves and, and work with it and developed a uh, developed a, an inventory so to speak so they've, they've been very proactive in that approach the last subject i want to talk about is the housing issue and you talk you said that it is an issue for colchester county but I, I, while while we believe it is while we know it is an issue across canada what's colchester county doing now to sort of help alleviate the housing issue in the county because 
I can imagine you're probably trying to look at other different ways that you can get people to start building houses in your community, but also attracting new builders to the community as well. We've, we've, uh, obviously we have some municipally owned lands that we're, we're looking at. We've put out a request for proposals for uh, two or three parcels of our, of our, of our lands. And when they, when they come back, we'll have a look at what their proposals are for, for housing projects and you know we can take it into consideration green space to go with it and a number of other issues that go along with the housing development so we'll see what happens when the proposals come back in and then make a decision to move forward with something from there I, i'm not sure if i should ask this question but i feel like i i need to you talk about the pol the the police incident, not incident, but the shooting that happened in Colchester County uh, last year. Um, and I, I want to just ask this follow up question, and only this follow up question: of This, how is how is the community doing? The community is still trying to grasp with the reality of what took place in 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 that in that April. You know, it's there's going to be people who are going to be affected for the rest of their life. There's, you know, there's, it's going to be a long process and the, the, the help has got to come forward to, to help people deal with, with the grief and the trauma that, that they're dealing with. Some, uh, as I said earlier, there's, there's some that are, that are still hurting very much from this. I appreciate you answering that question, Jeff, and I appreciate, I apologize for putting you on the spot there. Um, I want I want to talk about one last issue before we turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time now and I, I just realized we're at the half hour mark. I can't believe it's already been a half hour flown by, but here we are. Um, I want to I want to ask about um, the future of Colchester County. Um, a lot of municipalities are struggling until we get this new fiscal framework. We are sort of in this unknown spot because unlike federal and provincial governments, you cannot run debt. While you can put away uh, money, you're sort of stuck uh, with the fiscal framework that you have. What does the future look like for Colchester County, do you believe? I think Colchester has a lot of potential. We are we sit sort of in the hub of Nova Scotia, so you know we've got the main the main traffic flow coming east and west from Amherst through to Cape Breton. You've got to go right by the Truro corridor. And then you've got to go to go to Halifax. You have to cut right through Colchester County to get there. I, you know, growth potential I think is is on our side. You know, we we've been fortunate in the last number of years to be able to maintain a reasonable tax rate, no major increases for a number of years, and been able to hold that with with growth and increased in tax assessments. We've been able to maintain the rate, so. You know, I think we've got great potential here. And I think, you know, as long as we continue to move forward in a reasonable and fiscal responsible way, I think I think we've got great potential. Now I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna get you to take off your deputy mayor hat and put on your FCM hat, just like I asked Tim Tierney to do it, Councillor Tierney to do it in <laughs> our chat with him. Um uh, we talk about the the future of Colchester County, but what about municipalities in Canada? What is the future of municipalities in Canada? Coming from the vice president of FCM, what does it look like for the future of municipalities in Canada, do you think? I think we, we're definitely going to have our challenges. We all are going to have our challenges moving forward. I think, you know, we've got to, all as I stated earlier, all levels of government have gotten to come to the table and sit and have more cooperation and collaboration to work together. There's only one. There's only one taxpayer, and how the funds are distributed. You know, municipalities through the Canada Community Canada's Community Building Fund, municipalities have proven that they can be responsible and distribute the funds in in a manner that is beneficial to most Canadians. And we've proved we've proven that over a number of years, and I think. If, if the federal and provincial governments will sit and have that cooperation and collaboration with municipalities and all three levels work together, everybody can prosper. I appreciate it. Kind of the same answer that Tim gave. So I'm not sure if you guys are talking <laughs> to each other, but it seems like you guys are on the same page. <laughs> I'll ask Cooper on the same page. <laughs> exactly. I'll talk to Rebecca next and she'll give you the exact same answer. 
I want to turn to my last subject, and it's my favorite subject because I have promised if you come on my show, I will be out in your community. I love tourism. I just spent uh, almost four, three weeks driving across Canada, visiting the communities that have come on my show. I think more people should be spending their tourism dollars here in Canada because I think there's a story that people don't tell municipally when it comes to tourism. So I want to ask you about Colchester County and where are the hidden gems? What are the tourist destinations that people need to see if they're coming through Colchester County this year or next year, like I am? <laughs> well, I, I we've, we've got many, many, many gems here for for tourism we're we sit on the bay of fundy which are the highest tides in the world the highest recorded tides in the world and we also have the north armorland shore which has some of the warmest sandy beaches north of the carolinas you know for example and you know we've got in colchester county we've got three wonderful municipal parks on one on a river one's on the bay of fundy and one is on the north armorland shores we've got cycling trails we've got walking trails you know it, it there's no shortage you know the cliffs of fundy have been just was two years ago recently named a unesco global geopark and that goes right from wow. cumberland county's apple river to uh, the fundy discovery site which municipality colchester is developing right now it was a former restaurant motel and just outside the town of Truro. And we've we bought the property a number of years ago and we turned it into a destination for people to come. It was where most people came to the area to to observe the tidal bore when it comes in. So we've taken those lands and we're turning it into a, a destination for people to come to. We've got you know for winter months we've got uh, just outside of Colchester, but Ski Wentworth with a, a ski hill in the area. We've got our, our neighboring municipality, the town of Truro. There's a beautiful park there, the Fundy, uh, the uh, Victoria Park. And again, it has waterfall in it and then some beautiful walking trails and place for people to visit. We've got a fantastic number of waterfalls in the area that, and there's a there's actually a book out waterfalls in Nova Scotia that you can look at and that'll guide you around to the different walking you know, trails in to see all these different waterfalls golf courses, ATV trails. You just perked my ears up with golf course there, Jeff. So <laughs> I, I might be coming out to golf with you if I don't know it that way. Um, what about yourself, Bill? What about, where do you go? Where do you go after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work? Where do you go to decompress? And you cannot say the same thing that every other counselor I talk to says, my own house. Where do you go in the community well, to go get away and just decompress and get back to your center? To me, I, I love the salt water or or a walk in the woods. And those and those are the two places. In the in the summertime, we have a, a travel trailer on on a on a beach lot that we get away to. And I can I can go to that, but where I live in 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 this community of Brookfield, we have a lot of woods in our area. So I I've always liked the woods, and quite often I'll just go park a vehicle and get out and take a walk up a woods road or through a trail or somewhere just to get away and get your mind get your mind at ease. I appreciate you answering that. Honestly, <laughs> it's the first time that someone actually did go back to saying their house. So thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I want to turn to my last question. I think it's the million dollar question here, Jeff. And that is what makes Colchester County such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family. I I think there's many things here. It's, it's a relaxed way of life. It's, you know, it's reasonably priced to to get to purchase a home. We've got all kinds of assets with we have a number of rinks and swimming pools for recreation use. As I mentioned earlier, cycling trails. There's uh, cultural centers. You know, it's it's there's everything. You know, great great uh, schooling systems for for people who are raising children. You know, our the hospital that's here is only roughly 12 years old since it was built so you know we've got some great infrastructure in the area for people to use and you know, I, I just think that where we're centered in the province we're an hour from Halifax so we can have a, a little more of a, a rural lifestyle but you're we're only 50 50 minutes away 
if we want to be in the city. So. I want to thank you so much, Jeff, for doing this. It's always a pleasure to sit down with municipal leaders from across Canada. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for talking about your community, talking about the role of a counselor, and just talking about why municipal matters, because I think it truly does, and I think not a lot of people know that. So thank you so much. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure, and it's say it, being involved with the last 11 years, it, 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 is, a, it is a passion. I, I thoroughly enjoy what I do every day, and I can honestly say I haven't had a day where I regretted putting my name on a ballot. Well, wait, wait till you take over FCM next year and then <laughs> don't talk to me that. Thanks so much, Jeff, for this. You're more than okay. welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like today's episode. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes and is on our website. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep driving and delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, remember, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.